Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the Mandel Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this ongoing series of conversations with scholars of Jewish education. We created this series as a way to share scholarship in the field of Jewish education with a broad audience of educators and Jewish leaders. At the Mandel Center, we're committed to developing and promoting scholarship in Jewish education, especially scholarship on teaching and learning in Jewish education, in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. That's our mission. And today's session and our other events help us to serve our mission by getting important ideas out into the world. We encourage you to take a look at the Mandel Center events page to see the rest of our uh, upcoming events. And we're delighted to have so many of you joining us live. We hope to be able to take some of your questions as we go. So please feel free to post those questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we're also recording today's session and we'll make the recording available afterwards on the website and then later also as a podcast for any of uh, those who could not join us today. But the recording will only capture uh, the presenters, uh, Ziva Hassenfeld and me, and not the audience. Now, our guest today is my colleague here at the Mandel Center at Brandeis, Ziva Hassenfeld. She's coming to us just from uh, two doors down from my office. Uh, Ziva holds a PhD from Stanford. Uh, she completed postdocs uh, here at Brandeis and also at Tufts. And now she serves as the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Professor of Jewish Education, Assistant Professor of Jewish Education. She has published widely on the teaching and learning of Tanakh. And today we're going to talk about a new article that's uh, just about to come out in, in the coming weeks in the Journal of Jewish Education. Uh, that is called A Pedagogical Approach to Teaching Biblical Hebrew in American Day Schools. Ziva, welcome. It's good to see you. It's so um, good to be here with you, John. <laughs> great. As I just mentioned, we want to talk about your forthcoming article uh, about teaching biblical Hebrew. Um, and as I always like to do, I want to start with the backstory for this uh, for this project. How did you decide... Well, let's start at the general level. How did you decide that you wanted to study the teaching and learning of Tanakh in general, and and then in particular the teaching and learning of Biblical Hebrew? Tell us tell us something about that, and maybe also tell us something about your methodology. How do you actually undertake this kind of work? Absolutely. So I don't know how far back you want me to go um, to the womb or uh, <laughs> my own childhood, but I'll I'll, I'll take it from. Um, the most obvious starting point, which is that I was a Tanakh teacher um, at Gann Academy. I absolutely adore the literacy practice of reading Tanakh, of reading Jewish texts, and I think it is special. I think it is unique. I think it has something to offer the larger literacy world, and so um, I love doing it as an insider. I love doing it as a scholar. I love doing it as a teacher. I love doing it as a parent. Um, so that's, so the love is real. Um, that's how I got into this. And the scholarship grew out of the love. Um, I just had some questions that I wasn't able to answer in the classroom. And so the way to, to get answers was to train myself as a qualitative researcher and to learn how you actually uh, conduct research and answer questions. So that is what happened between leaving the classroom at Gann Academy and um, arriving here as, your colleague and and um and tell us a little bit more what that looks like you, you talked about doing qualitative research so what kinds of data do you typically gather and what do you do with those data absolutely so i think that um i think i'm unique in the sense that my favorite form of research is teacher research so um, i'm not afraid to go back into the classroom and i feel that there are times where the questions that my research leads me to so i might do one project where i'm doing uh think alouds with teachers and classroom observation and classroom ethnography and i might do another project where i'm doing task-based interviews with students but often where that leads me is um wow 
I need, I need to try this. Uh, I have some thoughts and the only way to answer them is to try it. And so my favorite method is actually to go back into the classroom and teach. And the way that I do that is, um, of course, under IRB supervision, I will create a relationship with a school and allow, um, they will allow me to come in and teach. And I get uh, student permission, parent permission, and I record the classes. Um, an important part of my methodology is to not only focus on transcript. In other words, it's not only about discourse analysis of what is said in the classroom, but I'm really building towards um, a more full embodied analysis of how are students positioning themselves in the classroom physically? How's the teacher, which sometimes is myself, sometimes another teacher, physically positioning them? Um, what are the ways that we communicate agency, authority, um, power through body language, as well as obviously spoken language? So a, a lot of qual qualitative researchers will uh, conduct a bunch of interviews and you, you often will do that. But you're also describing another element of the work, which is a kind of more naturalistic setting. Which yeah, is interviews like... are my least favorite because uh -huh. I think they're really uh, inaccurate when we report about ourselves. Um, you know, you can talk and talk and talk about yourself, but actually, I think the things I know best about you are from times we've spent actually engaging in activities together. Um, and so I'll do interviews, uh, but I, I take them with a grain of salt. So what I really like to do is um, is actually see people doing a task, see people doing a learning task, see people doing a reading task, see people doing a literacy practice. And if if if, if seeing them, if, if I'm making too many interpretations from just watching them do it, I might show it to them and do a, a stimulated recall interview where I say, hey, this was super interesting when you were translating this word with your students. Can you remember what you were thinking or what were the dilemmas of practice that were coming up as you were in that teaching moment? Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so a lot of the, a, a lot of the data will be um, will be uh, video recordings of uh, of classrooms, of interactions, sometimes of your own classroom, sometimes of other people's classrooms, um, kind of teaching moments or moments of uh, of of children interpreting text. Those kinds of those kinds of data, which you then will go back to over and over and over again in order to really understand what's going on to figure out the patterns. Yes, microanalysis is essential to my work. In other words, so much, we can unpack so many different things within a one minute recording of a classroom, a one minute recording of a conversation, one minute recording of um, a child reading a text, because um, there's just so many angles. And what I've allowed myself to do in my analysis is to not commit to one angle, but following some of um, my role models in literacy, Laura Hansfield, um, and uh, Mary Jewswick, like, it's okay. This is a complicated thing because learning is complicated and humans are complicated and we have multiple identities and we have multiple uh, resources that we're pulling from. And so as I'm understanding what's happening here, I'm gonna allow myself to say, hey, I wanna investigate this from the position of social power. I wanna investigate this from the position of language and literacy. And I wanna investigate this from the position of who this child is in the world and where they come from. So you've already mentioned literacy a number of times. You've used the term literacy practice. And I want to circle back to that because I think for a lot of people who love Tanakh, love teaching Tanakh, love learning Tanakh, that's not necessarily the framework that they will typically think about. So I, I want to learn more about that, I'll hear more about that from you. But before we get to that, um, Let's think for a minute about this particular article. Um, as I said, it's called uh, Pedagogical Approach to Teaching Biblical Hebrew in American Day Schools. And, and help us understand at the, at the most abstract level, at the 30,000 foot level, what do you want people to know about the teaching of biblical Hebrew from this article? Great. And um, so, so let me explain why I wrote this article and what it's trying to do. I, I, I would have what to stand on if I want to say right now to you um, that, that I am just absolutely committed that all Jewish texts need to be studied in, um, in their language that they were composed in. And it's our responsibility as Jewish educators in the Jewish world to ensure that the next generation can do that work. I, would, I could quote to you Bialik, 
that uh, reading and translation is like kissing a bride with a veil on. I could quote to you Ruth Weiss, who says everyone knows that a real Jew, an authentic Jew, can read from the Torah scroll in the original Hebrew. I could quote you all that, but that's actually not my motivation. That's not where I'm coming from. The reason why I found myself doing biblical Hebrew work, which is really new for me, um, in the sense that I don't study language acquisition. I don't study heritage language. I don't study second language acquisition. That's not my training. I'm in literacy. But what I do know is this. I know that um, any literacy practice, I know we haven't talked about that yet, but it's not really um, pedagogically ideal to limp through any literacy practice for 12 years, nine years, right? So either we need to be studying these texts and allowing our children and our students to access these texts in the biblical Hebrew, or we need to not. And so the motivation for this work was just, I'm seeing a lot of limping through. I'm seeing that schools uh, in will say that they are committed to standard number one in the standard benchmarks project, which is, which is accessing the text in the original language. But what that means is throwing in a clause here, throwing in a clause there. Now, um, my colleague um, at, at YU um, Goldberg, he has a fabulous piece that was from Cashy that talks about, right? Like there, Scott we Goldberg. have strategies. Yeah, Scott Goldberg, we have strategies for, for getting students to a place that they can really decode and that they can read with fluency and comprehend. Um, and so if we want to do it, we have to do it. So that was sort of the motivation for this. If we don't want to do it, you know, I don't have a horse in the race. Like I'm interested in meaning making, uh -huh. but if, if we're gonna, if we can't just throw, you know, actually, did you know that for three years we were saying, you know, Avraham Holech, and now we're going to say Vayelech and just do something with that child. Right. So that was where I sort of came in and said, like, let's not limp through this. Let's do it. So that's a really, it's a really powerful metaphor, uh, limping through. Um, and, and I hear what you're saying that, you know, if there's an affirmative choice to teach texts in translation, that, that's a choice, Come, <coughs> comes with a cost. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if we're actually going to access the test and let's be the text in the original language, let's be much more reflective about it and really scaffold the structures to help students uh on those understand those texts and to become empowered readers of the of the original text rather than feeling like you know it's some kind of maze that they or you know they they sometimes get a little bit of a window into but basically it's they, they never feel like they really have they really have agency um in that domain so that's really powerful um and and the, the metaphor of limping i think is is one that um i'll hold on to for for a long time but let's let's get to this question about about literacy, <clears throat> because um, as I said, there you know there are many wonderful um, uh, people who are engaged in the study of Tanakh and the teaching of Tanakh, but they wouldn't necessarily think about their own work as a literacy practice, and um, and they may wonder why it is that that's the kind of theoretical framework and the theoretical literature that you bring to bear. Um, on uh, on this research, on the teaching and, and learning of Tanakh. So tell us more about that. Absolutely. And that's sort of the nature of a literacy practice. In other words, it's usually not, right, our most, um, our most fluent literacy practices, that is the things that we do with texts, were usually not taught to us through direct instruction. We're usually inducted into them um, in, a, in a situated practice, right? So that if you're used to... Um, flipping through the comics while your parents read the newspaper on, on Shabbat morning or Sunday morning, right? I'm not sure that you would have the meta language to say, oh, I'm, I have a literacy practice that is flipping through and, it, and it, there's a material aspect to it and there's a social aspect to it. And I always smell the coffee that so I associate with Calvin and Hobbes, da, 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 right? So that's fine, of course, right? Like that's that's what we do here in the Ivy Tower. We, we use jargon. Um, but hopefully the jargon is helpful in the sense that like, okay, you're here, you're here with me and I'm inviting you to say, huh, this is a literacy practice, right? The way, and of course there are multiple literacy practices in any Jewish educational context and any Jewish text. And that's part of what in my work I try to, um, I try to sort out, right? How do we deal with that? How do we talk about that? How do we teach that? But on some basic level, um, you know, Rabbi Shai Held begins his book by saying, the gift that we gave, that the Jewish people gave the world, 
is the gift of close reading. And I love that. And he, he cites Rabbi Lawin, but I love that he starts his, you know, Parsha Shavua book with that, because even though the technical term close reading has come to mean something very different in my field in literacy, um, he's saying it to a Jewish audience. And as a Jewish audience, most of us know what he's talking about. That he's talking about, you know, He's talking about Shivim Panin Torah. He's talking about this idea that we like to take a term, take a word, and 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 play with it and unpack it and, and offer multiple meetings. And we and there's all of these ways that we do this in uh, Jewish literacy practices. Let me say practices. Um, and so that's special. That's really special in my mind. And that has something to offer the larger world. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about a literacy practice, that we have a way of, and we do it, you know, sometimes through academic disciplines, sometimes through Chazal, through the Talmud, sometimes through Midrash, sometimes through modern feminist scholarship. But we have a way of really, La Sopa de Vretora, of really sitting with every single word when we study Tanakh, when we study texts. Um, and that's special. So you're naming a a feature of um, say of Jewish subcultures. Obviously, there's not one there's not one culture here, but of of certain Jewish subcultures that is very comfortable engaging, um, uh, not, not engaging in a text in order to extract information, right? Not reading a text, uh, not solely for the plot. But um, but sitting with the text in a slow way and allowing allowing a certain degree of play of of questioning of exploration um, and you're call, you're naming that a literacy practice Damn, yes which, which actually then says if um, you know there there because there are many literacy practices that all have validity in particular contexts. But if this is one of the literacy practices, how do, how does that then shape uh, the the broader discourse around literacy in in general education? Exactly. So that so that's really the heart of my work. So the piece that we're talking about today is just a, a tiny piece of that, which is simply like you do have to be able to decode and and comprehend on some basic level a text to be able to engage in a literacy practice around it. Um, that's not necessarily true, actually. I want to take that back uh, because there are literacy practices that are all about oral recitation and chanting. So I want to take that back. But in the context of my work and in the context of what I'll call Jewish literacy practices around reading Tanakh, there is an assumption that you um, are able to decode the text. Um, and so, yeah, my question is like, OK, so we have this literacy practice and it, it takes different shapes in different communities and a child might um, might actually talk about um, authorial intent in Tanakh a lot at home and it might not get spoken about in the classroom or vice versa, right? So there's some negotiation within a child's education, right? Like what exactly are you asking me to do? And that's gonna change depending on the context, whether it's their home or their synagogue or this teacher's classroom or that teacher's classroom, or they switch schools for some other reason. Um, or camp, et cetera. So there's that internal negotiation, but then there's the, let's say that whole web is in conversation with all the other literacy practices that they engage in in the world, whether it's in history class, English class, uh, the soccer field, field, right? Basketball <laughs> court. I'm always trying to be inclusive and then I just explode, I don't know things. Um, so, how does a child sort of navigate that, right? We live right. in a multimodal world. We live in a multi-literacy world. And, and I'm saying two things at once. I'm saying we have a special literacy, group of literacy practices. And it's only special if we help children figure out how they put it in conversation with all the other literacy practices that they engage in. So let me pick up on a question that, that just came in from, um, from uh, one of uh, a member of our audience. Um, you you're committed to literacy, and this is the this is the discipline that you come out of, the research base that you come out of. Um, other people might talk about interpretation or hermeneutics. Um, so why 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 do you, why do you feel comfortable with the term literacy rather than talking about interpretation of texts? Okay, great. Um, so some of this some of this is sort of just. Um, 
sorting through sorting through academic language and, and choosing who you're in conversation with and deciding what terms you use. In other words, it's not that I don't address questions of hermeneutics. It's not that I'm not in talking about interpretation. Um, but the reason why I choose literacy practice is because it comes out of a place in my field of study that says, um, that first of all, starts from the premise like, what we do with texts, and here I'm talking about text broadly, whether it's a print text or a spoken text or a piece of art, um, has social purposes. We do it with people, we do it for social purposes, we are motivated by our own identities, and that it, there's no hierarchy. And I think that's an important thing to say, right? There's no hierarchy, there's no cognitive advantages. Let me say something that um, is a given where I come I from. I didn't understand though. So when you say no hierarchy between what and what, I didn't follow that. Yeah, let me, so, so I'm about to, I'm just not a trigger warning, but I'm saying I'm about to say something exciting and controversial. Uh, <laughs> there's no hierarchy, right? So if you're really, really good at reading and understanding complicated novels and you're really good at writing, what traditionally um, in the 50s we considered like literacy and, and let's talk about liter literate cultures and literate people, they are not cognitively superior to communities, cultures, people, individuals who are really good at uh, recitation or singing or creating art. So that's like, that's where I start. That is my theoretical framework. That is the world I come from. And that's why I choose to use the language of, because I'm signaling to, you know, to the people in my field, hey, I'm part of sociocultural literacy. I'm part of those people who understand or believe, maybe we're mistaken, that literacy practices are valuable within the context of a given community, a given society, a given culture. But there's not like some, um, you know, hierarchy that is is from Sinai, you know, that or or some cognitive hierarchy that some are better than others. And that's important to me to signal. And one of the fascinating things to think about is really what what work does reading. Does this interpreting, does the study of Tanakh do? What work does it do for a culture? What do, work does it do for an individual? And, you know, when, it, this is not about putting somebody on the couch. It's just about understanding that literacy does work in the world. It does work for people, social rewards, social positioning, connections to other people, connections to meaning. Um, I want to I want to shift a little bit. Um, to, Before to, we shift, can I say yeah, one go, more thing? Please, please, okay. please. Okay. Uh, and I want to ship with you. I just want to say one more thing because I want to also like, I know uh, who we're speaking with today and I'm so excited about who's here. And I want to say like, just for the Jewish educators um, who work tirelessly on this stuff, right? Who I'm sitting here like pontificating with you and they're, you know, doing classroom management with 15, 20, 25 kids in the room. Some of which are saying, I don't care, right? And so I just want, before we shift, I want to say something, um, which is that some day school students really and Sunday school families and communities really have an have an inherent um, attachment to this particular literacy practice that being um, reading and knowing Tanakh and maybe being able to read it in the biblical Hebrew um, and some don't and yet the teachers in Jewish day schools teach all of these students. And so these questions are not just theoretical, but they actually have implications for dilemmas of practice and pedagogy that come up, right? Okay, so a kid says, I don't care. In fact, my friend once told me, I, I have a lot of brilliant friends. Uh, I'm lucky like that. And one of my brilliant friends, Amy Newman said to me, she was talking about a uh, class discussion and someone said some brilliant, um, insight into the text that pulled on background knowledge and a few things. And this kid turned and said, imagine knowing or caring what any of that meant. And it was such a like rich dilemma of practice, right? Okay, now my friend Amy has to explain this literacy practice that both of those kids are required to engage in at least for the 45 minutes a day that they're with her. And so when I talk about a literacy practice and when I name the fact that it has social purposes, I also wanna name the fact that it might not have social purposes and, and that our teachers are dealing with students who might not feel um, that this gives them cultural capital. Right, right. And it's the ongoing work of, of individual teachers, classrooms, schools to be building those worlds and rebuilding those worlds together with, with students. Yeah. Um, 
So in this in this particular article that that we're um, that we're talking about, you offer five principles. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you offer five principles for the teaching of biblical Hebrew texts. And when when the article comes out, it's not out yet, but it will be out shortly. Um, everyone will be able to um, to see more about that. But I want to focus in on the last one which you call making textual thinking visible, making textual thinking visible. And you're, you're, um, you're echoing other work in the field about, uh, about visible thinking. And here's what you write. Um, and this is a quote, all of the work that teachers ask students to do in biblical Hebrew should be in the service of facilitating students' textual thinking and interpretation. All of the work should be in the service of facilitating students' textual thinking and interpretation. Explain what this was a really rich sentence, a really powerful sentence. Tell us what you mean by this. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'm excited. So essentially, um, again, and this comes from, from sociocultural theories of learning and of knowledge. Um, and all of this um, sort of has come to me through certain mentors that I had in my graduate program and my graduate study. But the basic idea is this, um, what reading is across literacy practices, but certainly in literacy practices such as um, the study of Tanakh, where the gift we gave is close reading, what the actual literacy practice is, what reading is, is, is um, taking a sign and creating a new sign, is the opportunity to say, huh, I'm reading this, and I believe that it means this. And I believe that it means this because of that. So that's so we articulating practice. whether that's orally or in writing, articulating a meaning. Exactly. And so uh, but we can't induct students into that into that practice without letting them engage in the practice. So let me say that because it's actually not a complicated idea at all. You don't learn without doing. And so all I'm saying is that. Um, when we're doing a literacy practice that ultimately that the real communities of practice are going to ask our students, um, what do you think this text means? What's your interpretation? Um, when you apply this particular hermeneutics, where do you arrive at, right? If, you, if we want them to be able to answer that question, we better let them practice answering that question in school. So you want, you, you want in this principle, you're saying you're asking educators to keep their eye on the prize. If the prize is enabling students to do the thing, to, to engage in literacy practice, you have to give them the opportunity to do that rather than assuming that there's a kind of um, passive um, accumulation of knowledge, which someday in the future may magically uh, emerge as a literacy practice. Exactly. And it, it's not like a huge shift. So, for example, like, OK, you want to teach Rashi, you want to teach Ramban, right? So it's it's just saying like instead of instead of saying, wow, look at their brilliant insight into the text, saying, huh, what was the question they had and what was the work they did to arrive at the answer they arrived at? Uh, same thing with your Devar Torah, right? It's about you're at Shabbat Shira or you're, it's, you know, right before uh, the kids go home on Friday and you're giving over a little Torah. Don't just give it over. But actually, like, say, what was the question and what was the interpretive work I did to offer the answer that I'm offering? And, of course, we ask kids to do this right now. That's best practices in math. That's best practice in science. Um, so it's not it's not really a break from anything else happening across the school day. It's just naming. Um, let's do that more and let's bring awareness to our intention setting in doing that, in saying, I'm not just going to tell you what I think this text means, but I'm going to tell you why I think it means that and the work I did to get there. Wonderful. So um, as always, we're the time the time has flown by. Um, we are almost out of time. I want to ask you just a final question. We we called the session why Jewish day schools should teach students to read Torah. So yeah, well, what's the answer? <laughs> Sorry. So I, I was I was I was joking with you uh, that a lot of people were texting me like, oh, you're going to talk about laning. I'm happy to talk about laning. We haven't talked about laning. Um, but well, why does I, it matter? Why does it matter? Again, I'm going to go back to something that I talked about earlier. Um, it, it doesn't matter from an academic perspective. It doesn't matter on some, um, some objective level in the sense of like, hey, this is the skill that's going to get your kids a high paying job, get them into an Ivy League school. It might. 
Uh, but that's not why I'm going to say it matters. It matters because it's a literacy practice that we as a community have uh, chosen to invest in. And we say that it's valuable. And, um, you know, one time you told me that my research is vintage, retro. I can't remember what word you used. <laughs> Tanakh? I feel like timeless would have been the better description. <laughs> um, but that this is like, do I happen to think it's a phenomenal literacy practice that has a lot of transfer? Yes, but that's not the point. The point is that we as a community care about it, right? And the way that we want to teach is we want to share what we care about, not tell them, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You need to know this and you haven't yet learned that, but just say, hey, come participate in this activity that we care about because we think it's awesome. And you know what? Your parents thought it was awesome and your grandparents thought it was awesome. And that's why we give half a day to it. That's why um, I want to do this work. Wonderful. Wonderful. So if, uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, the uh, why Jewish day schools should teach students to read Torah has to do with um, what it means to induct students into um, into a community, into the practices of a community through which they then connect to people and connect to ideas and connect to values um, and uh, and situate themselves uh, in the world in, in deeper and, and more meaningful ways. Um, Ziva, thank you. Um, we're, uh, we're out of time. It's always great to talk with you about your work. I'm, I'm so delighted that we get to do it um, uh, on a regular basis, but now we've gotten to do it in a somewhat public fashion as well. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I encourage you to check out the Mandel Center events page to learn about other upcoming events and videos of prior events. Our next session in this series will be on February 8th, when I will be speaking with Dr. Anna Hartman about children's theories about Ju Judaism. So please join us then. Thank you again, Ziva. Thank you all for joining us. Be well.